This week's episode of our show has been sponsored by our very own Dungeons of Drakenheim campaign, which is just coming off the heels of our amazingly successful Kickstarter. But if you missed out, we got a pre-order starting up. Our pre-order is now live, so you can grab your copy of Dungeons of Drakenheim. This campaign, which is set in a ruined dark fantasy city for characters levels 1 to 13, is now available for you to pre-order and will be delivered shortly after the fulfillment of our Kickstarter. Over the course of our Kickstarter campaign, we were able to do so many awesome things to augment the world of Drakenheim, including Dungeon Master screens, miniatures, maps, and adding all new adventure sites from all the amazing stretch goals that we unlocked along the way. So if you didn't happen to get in on our Kickstarter, you can pre-order the book now by following the links to the Ghostfire Gaming Store right down below. And now, onto this week's episode. Greetings! My name is Monty Martin. And I'm Kelly McLaughlin. And, and we, we are, are the, the Dungeon, Dungeon Dudes. Dudes. Welcome to our channel, where we cover everything D&D, including advice for players and guides for DMs. We upload new videos on Tuesdays and Thursdays, so please subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an episode. Today, we are looking at the basics for creating a fantasy town for your campaigns in Dungeons & Dragons and other tabletop role-playing games. I think for many Dungeon Masters, the first town that you create is like your first step on the journey of world building, your own campaign setting. It is one of the most important aspects of any campaign world. You need a town that the players are going to go to for information or downtime or shopping, a place where they can sleep and rest or buy new gear for their next adventure or sell the loot from their previous adventure. Once you've designed your first dungeon, your players are going to need a safe haven somewhere that they can return to to take a good night's rest, get their next quest, and interact with the rest of the world. And of, oftentimes, a good hometown grounds your player characters in the world, and it gives them something to care about, something to fight for. Um, there's nothing quite like being that plucky, small-town hero that saves the town from goblins, bandits, monsters, or anything else, and then goes on to bigger and better things in the wider world. So many fantasy stories and so many D&D &D campaigns begin with this quintessential small town. And so we wanted to talk today about what actually goes on in making one of these things. Because I think that if you've read a lot of adventures, many times when you read the way a town is presented in an adventure, you get a town map and it then has a list of numbers of all the buildings on that town. And so I think today what we want to do is reverse engineer that. Of How do we get to that map with that list and all those descriptions? Because what you actually need in your fantasy town might not be very intuitive at first. We also want to specify that today we are talking about creating a fantasy town in the aspect of a safe haven for downtime, resting, and shopping. There is a chance that you are creating a town that is going to be the adventure location for your players. You still might want to use some of the principles and guidelines that we present in this video, but then you're going to layer many of the dungeon design mechanics that we've talked about in other videos on top of that. If you are designing a town that is going to be attacked by monsters or have dark secrets around every corner and mischievous NPCs that are lying and trying to steer the players into danger, that's not exactly what we're doing here, but some of the principles still work. So there's a lot to discuss today, so let's get rolling. When Kelly and I design our own fantasy villages and towns, the real goal here is to build a list. It really starts with that list, and, it, and it's almost deceptively simple how much you really need to design. Basically, you might make that map eventually. Maybe you even start with that map. But really what it boils down to is we want to build a list of locations, and with each location, we want a character that lives or works there, and maybe a one-line description. I find that for a good-sized fantasy town, if you have a list of maybe 10 places, each with one NPC and a one-sentence description, you've got a pretty meaty fantasy town, and it's surprising how much prep work can go into just getting that far. So that's our goal today. What we want to start with are the, kind of the three big questions, then look at the, play, the questions that players ask when they enter a new settlement to help us have answers to those questions, 
and then some more brainstorming questions to help us build this list of ideas that is going to build form the basis of our fantasy town. But I think the three main questions that we do kind of want to begin with are, what are the essential services and non-player characters that our players need between their adventures that need to be in this town? This question is important because it inspires the gameplay functionality of your town, which is really the most important element. This is a game, so the first thing you need to think of for your town is what is inspiring the gameplay mechanics that the players need to engage with in order to prepare for their next adventure or settle their previous adventure. But this is also a story, so we also want to think about how our town might contribute to the narrative, inspire the quests or the missions, and how the town might build on the lore that we are creating for our world. These might not be front and center in your players' minds, but they have a lot to inform the backdrop of your setting. Lastly, how do we make this feel like a vibrant and believable place? What questions do we need to ask ourselves and what can we do to amplify and flesh out the town to make the players feel like it's a living, breathing space that they can interact with? So again, gameplay, narrative, and what we would call verisimilitude are kind of the three pillars of building a fantasy town and what we want to put into it as we're preparing it for our games. So let's start off with gameplay. And I think the best way to do this is, Kelly, you are a player character. You have just arrived in the town of Taunton. What questions are you gonna ask the very first person you meet on the street? Probably, where's the inn? <laughs> <laughs> I think for games of Dungeons and Dragons, this is the absolute cornerstone. Even though when we look back in true real world history, many small towns, probably would not have a true inn or tavern. For gameplay purposes, we gotta have one. <laughs> you either have to have an inn or some sort of establishment that can allow the players to take a rest. And thinking about your inn is also going to inspire where characters might gain information. There's always some good NPCs in an inn that they can talk to. So the inn is kind of the cornerstone mm -hmm of your town. Uh, it can always be tempting to have sketchy inns or dive bars and, you know, questionable taverns and other establishments, but ultimately, when the player characters are low on hit points and low on spell slots, they want somewhere where they can safely take a long rest. And if we do want to give them that opportunity, we want to have a nice cozy inn for them to bed down on, get ripped off by the innkeeper, because of course the innkeeper is going to see that they're adventurers and charge them 50 gold pieces for a room, and the player characters really aren't going to question how that impacts the local economy, but that's fine. This is a game, not a simulator. I, I do think that when you're designing an inn, some key elements to keep in mind is what type of inn is it? Is it a large and popular place? Is it a very small town where not many people stay here? Who is the innkeeper? Who's working? Now you have to create that NPC that's going to be that sort of voice for the player characters to engage with. What does the sign look like? What is this inn known for? And what's the quirky thing that makes it stand out and that the player characters will remember it for? If you've got a particularly large town, maybe you'll design two or three inns, but really you can get away with just one. One of the things that I like to do with my inn, innkeepers as well is oftentimes the, the inn is run by a family. It's a family business. It can add a lot of quirk and you can really build out this whole cast of characters. And of course you have the opportunity to put other NPCs from town there because it's possible that the other locations in town when the players arrive in the evening are closed, but everyone's congregating at the local pub to have a brew. And so this is an opportunity where the players could actually meet the local blacksmith because he goes there to drink every night after six o'clock. And that brings us to the next most common question is most players showing up in town are going to ask, where can we find or buy equipment? This could be anything from a blacksmith where they can get their swords sharpened or improved as well as their armor, or there could be a shop that sells martial gear for adventurers. If you are drawing inspiration for your fantasy worlds from real world history, it's very unlikely that a blacksmith in a small town actually knows much about weaponsmithing or armorsmithing. 
many blacksmiths normally would do things like make nails and horseshoes uh, and maybe tools. So depending on how big the town is, it's possible the blacksmith might be like, yeah, I can't make you a long sword, sorry. Many small towns throughout real world history might have had a marketplace that gathered during the day. So depending on the feeling that you want to create for your world, it might not be appropriate for your town to have actual shops so much as a marketplace where people gather to sell their wares during the day. And by and large, most of these are gonna be pretty mundane things, like people are gonna bring animals or food or the types of goods and things that people use on an everyday basis, like clothing and tools. And so depending on the size of the town, it actually might be hard for your adventures to find gear. And this is where you could also do things like have the passing trader that is moving through town. So you say, well, there's nobody in town that actually has a weapon shop. But it turns out that there's this caravan going through town where you can get that sort of equipment. This actually makes it really simple. There's a great list in the player's guide for adventuring gear. And oftentimes, especially if they're entering a rather mundane town that doesn't sell a lot, and they go to the market, rather than having 10 shopkeepers, one person's there saying, get your rope here, and the other one's saying, you can buy empty vials from me. Um, I just say there's a bunch of little shops and markets and I flip open to the page and say they sell everything that is 10 gold or less on this list. One of my rules of thumb actually is make the population of the town the maximum value of any item that can be found there. So if you have a town of a thousand people, anything that is a thousand gold or less could be there. And you could actually vary this. So if you have a town that ha is particularly poor or remote, you might divide the population in half to determine the maximum value or a town that maybe is rich in minerals and does have specialized crafters, you might say, well, actually, this is a very wealthy town, so I'm gonna double the population based on that. And that, is, so you use the population of the town as kind of your barometer for the maximum value of whatever can be found there. The next question that you probably want to ask, which could be the same answer as the question before, but might be different, is where can the players sell their loot? Perhaps it's at the same market, but sometimes players' loot is a little bit too special to be sold to the rope salesman at the town market. So there might be a special NPC, again, a caravan, or perhaps a local wizard or some sort of more interesting person who might be after the loot that the players have obtained. Yeah, if the players have found things like magic items or artwork or gemstones that are particularly valuable, they might need to go to someone very specific in the town. Uh, Kelly mentioned that there could be a local wizard, but there could also be a local noble or a reeve or someone that is wealthy that lives in the town that actually has the money to buy these things from the players. They might even be a specific type of collector in, in mind as well. They might be someone that covets gemstones or covets rare art or is even willing to pay double the normal price for a rare book. Probably the population of the town at the very most can cannot buy anything that's worth their population as well. That you can invert that rule and say, you know, no individual merchant in town has more than a thousand gold at a time. So the players might need to work a little bit harder or barter or trade. One of the other questions that may come up from your players is a pretty straightforward one. It's who's in charge around here? Now, who's in charge around here could mean the local duke, mayor, king, lord, or it could be just the sheriff or head of the guard or some, uh, some person of authority who makes decisions for that town. This is often going to be a prominent NPC, so you want to always have this person planned out. Now, no small town is without its rivalries, so it's entirely possible that there could be multiple authority figures even in a very small town. Maybe the local priest and the local mayor have a long-standing rivalry. Maybe there are two noble families that the town grew up around their estates and they have at, at odds over each other. What's important is that the local authority usually has some measure of influence in the town, uh, whether that is a legal influence, a spiritual influence, or an economic influence. And so you can actually look at it in all those lenses. They might also have a military influence as well and decide, okay, what type of authority figure corresponds here. Oftentimes in my towns, I often have the mayor, the most prominent noble, the priest, and the captain of the guard or the sheriff or the constable. Those for me kind of form um, 
a nice power structure that works really, really well and makes sense within the context of a small town. Another common question is where are the players going to gather information? Now this could be answered by some of the previous questions. Shopkeepers could have information about the world and area surrounding, whereas the local authority might have information regarding uh, some of the problems surrounding the town at the moment or issues that they've been having. The inn could be a great place for characters to talk to many NPCs and gather lots of bits of information. What type of information are your players looking for, and who in town can they talk to to get that? This is where things might also connect with whatever quest or campaign storyline your characters are following. So this is where if there is an important person in town that the players need to talk to, you want to figure out how you kind of telegraph that to the players. Um, so, you know, if your players are looking for a wizard, well, the wizard's tower up on the cliff by the waterfall gives them a very clear indication of where they're supposed to go for that information. Whereas if you want to be much more subtle and maybe there is a group of thieves or bandits that are hiding out in the town and they've got a little bit more of a subtle presence there, that's where the players might have to ask the local innkeeper for information. So players, when they do come to town looking for information that helps them on their current quest, um, the markers of how they find that can be quite important because sometimes it can be a little bit um, tedious to have to talk to a bunch of NPCs to get to the NPC that you actually wanted to talk to in the first place. Your players might also come to town seeking healing or magical aid of some sort. This is where you can decide who has magical powers in your town. Is there anybody? Is there a local wizard who lives in the weird tower on the hill? Is there a local cleric who resides in the church in town? Or perhaps even a druid who is just on the outskirts of town near the edge of the woods with their druidic circle? Or you could even have multiple options that present different types of information, different types of authority, and different quests or plot hooks for the characters to engage in. My personal rule of thumb is that a town will almost never have a spellcaster that can cast higher than third level spells as an NPC. So if you go to the back of the monster manual, there's a list of NPC stat blocks that you can use to populate your town. And this is where I like using the priest stat block or the druid stat block. And very rarely I'll use the mage stat block because that's a character that can cast fifth level spells. But um, I make sure really carefully to be very choosy with how many spellcasting NPCs are present in my town. That's because in general, in my world, uh, there's not usually a lot of spellcasters. They exist. There's usually at least one in every town. But they're kind of like the local witch or a local recruit, re recluse. And in many cases, the priests might not actually be spellcasters properly. They might not truly be a cleric. You could go to a small town that's got a shrine to the gods, but the person there isn't necessarily a cleric. And if they are, maybe they only have like first and second level spells, tops. Um, especially with small settlements, I find it can be a little bit jarring, except in those rare cases where there might be like a very small town where it just happens that there is an archdruid that lives there because it's remote. In general, for me, um, if players are like, can we buy magic items here? It's like, you can get healing potions and maybe scrolls, um, but almost never are permanent magic items available for sale in small towns, unless there happens to be a merchant moving through or there's something particularly special about this town. The other thing that I'm usually careful of when I'm looking at magic in my towns is a lot of people who do come for healing Maybe they're just looking for a casting of cure wounds or something of that sort. If a player character has died and they are looking for resurrection of some sort, this is something that often I like to make a quest unto itself. Maybe the local priests know about somebody in a city far off. Or perhaps an NPC who lives in the reclusive monastery on top of the nearby mountain. Either way, if the player characters are looking for that type of magic, they're going to have to travel a little ways for it. Having a small town where the characters can just show up and be like, we lost an adventure, can you bring them back to life? Yes, this magic exists, but if every small town in your fantasy world had that, then people would live for a very long time and death would be an unreasonable fear in your mm -hmm. campaign setting. I also do like to tie that spellcasting ability to people that are notable figures within the community, but ones that perhaps are um, 
older or have important civic functions so that it doesn't beg the question from the players of like, well, you're a spellcaster. You should come help us on this adventure. That person can say, well, no, I'm the town healer. I can't risk my life. I do find that if there are too many adventurer type people in, in town, you can run into some trouble where the players are like, well, now we want to recruit a small army. And that can challenge things a bit. The last question that your players might ask about is, are there any problems in town? The players often will arrive in town looking for their next adventure. What is the plot hook that's going to drive them further? If they arrive in town and there's nothing interesting going on and they're just resting and they don't know what they're doing next, where's the campaign going? What's the story? Not every single location in town has to have a plot hook associated with it. There might be a large problem facing the town, such as bandits on the trade road, or there is a hippogriff that is plaguing the farm fields, or a bunch of trolls are in the woods, or the local druid has gone mad. Some sort of interesting fantasy problem that the players can get stuck in with, but I also do like to cover, color it with local flavor, like saying, you know, the butcher's boys got into a lot of trouble last night when they got super drunk. These weird kind of folksy problems around town do help make the place feel a little bit more vibrant, and maybe your players are going to get super into the fact that uh, the local butcher's boys got in a fight last night and got drunk, and that can turn into an adventure on its own. Sometimes inspiring the downtime with just a few pieces of gossip that don't necessarily tie into a larger plot can be really, really fun. But also this opens up what I call the Zelda mechanic, where sometimes they arrive in town and they're, they need the help of, say, the local lord. But the lord says, mm, I have a problem of my own, so before I can help you, I need to deal with the owl bears in the woods that ate one of our hunters. Until you help them, they can't help you. And it sends you on a rather mundane but somewhat cheeky and fun little adventure to then gain the support of the local leaders. So using the what's the problem in town can inspire a sort of chain of events that the players now need to interact with, get to know the town, get to know the people. Well, somebody's been eating all the crops for our, from our fields. You're going to have to talk to the farmers to find out what they know. You're going to have to do a bit of investigation, find out it was the owl bears at the edge of town. And once you've solved that problem, now everybody in town is happy, they like you, and they're willing to give you more information to send you on the main adventure quest. Now, if you've prepared answers to each of these questions, you probably have enough now ready to run your town at your table. This is probably going to hit the main things that your players are going to be interested in during the game. Despite this, though, there's still a few more questions that you might want to answer for yourself so that you can really make this place come to life in a vibrant and interesting way. Now, the first question actually does overlap with a piece of information your players are going to want to know, which is, what's the name of the town? Naming a town can be a lot of fun. Some people can actually find this really challenging. A lot of towns are named after either a local figure, hero, or it might be linked to the local trade or profession of the town. If it's a mining town, it might be called Glitterstone. If your town is called Mountain Cliff, it probably shouldn't be in the middle of a field. It should be on a mountain's cliff. So you can use the geography, the local trade or profession, or a local hero or figure to inspire the naming of your town. The name of your town gives that one little bit of colorful lore and history that speaks to how this world came about and what is important here. And so it can be a big clue for the players. The difference of the name from Fisher's Brook or Knight's Fall or dragon's end these tell stories on their own there's almost always a story in a name and this is the best way to communicate to your players yeah there's something special about this place and give them a clue as to what it is the next question to ask yourself is what is the population of your town a lot of the previous questions and a lot of the ideas that you're putting into your town can be inspired by how big the population is if you have a town of 15 people well, they probably don't sell many goods. They probably don't even have an inn. This is a small farming community that maybe somebody will put them up in their barn and they might have a few pieces of gossip. Whereas if you have a town of a thousand, then there's going to be much more moving components, many more NPCs to engage with, and a lot more going on. The other part of this question is, where does everybody live? 
Um, if you are someone that is artistically inclined and you do want to draw a map of your town, a really good rule of thumb is that every house has five people living in it. In it. So if you have a town of a thousand people, you need about 200 buildings, maybe? Um, again, it's a, it's a rough rule of thumb, but that helps you understand the relationship between the size and the space and how big physically your town actually might be. If you're drawing a map that has hundreds and hundreds of buildings and then 50 people live there, well, what's happened? Because now probably most of those buildings are abandoned. And vice versa, if you say that there's a thousand people living in your town and you present a map that has five buildings or 10 buildings, yeah, what's going on? Where, where are all those people? Yeah. So you really need to look at the map, look at the design you're doing and decide about how many people live here and who are the important figures in this town. And of course, maybe they don't live in houses. They could live in burrows because they're halflings or dwarves. They could live in tree houses because they're elves. So this is another cool opportunity to show a little bit of the lore of things by having people live in things that aren't quite houses. Maybe it's a seaside town and everyone lives in a boat that has been converted into a boathouse. A question that your players might not think about, but that is worth thinking about for yourself, though, is also where do all these people get fresh water and food? <laughs> what do they eat? A town needs a water source of some kind. If you're putting your town in a desert or in the tundra or on a mountain or somewhere, you need to decide, okay, is there a well here? Is there an aquifer? There's a reason why most local, most places are built either on the water or on a river. It's a good source of fresh water. If your town is surrounded by farmland that has uh, livestock and crops and a very famous orchard, well, now you can inspire the inn sells the famous beef from the local farmer or the famous ciders that, the, that are made from the local orchard. And by thinking a little bit about where the food and water sources come in, you also get to play around with what sort of foods and, and drinks are sold in your town. And these little, little details can actually add a lot of personality to your town. The larger your town, the more likely there are smaller settlements outside the town that operate as feeder villages, quite literally. If you have a town of a thousand people, there might be several small villages of about 50 people that are less than an hour's walk away from town or within a day of that town that are just the farmlands and the farmers that feed that village. The community around your town can actually be double or triple the people that live in the town because there can be smaller villages feeding into it. The next question to ask yourself is who or what protects and defends the town. Smaller towns might have a militia, bigger towns might have a town guard. Really small settlements might just have a sheriff and a deputy who monitor things throughout the town. If there's a small village in the middle of nowhere who doesn't see that many problems, there might not be a lot of local authority. If there are a bigger settlement that might have higher crime rates or issues with bandits or goblins or some sort of monster that lives nearby, they might need hunters or guards or town walls or watchtowers. And remember that if your town does have city walls, if there is a castle or a tower, if there is a guard or even an army, that implies a level of technology and society and culture that is quite sophisticated. So if you want to have your town that's surrounded by a wall, but it's in the remote fields and nobody knows how this wall got built, you're going to have to do some explaining as to how that all comes together. Conversely, if your town is in the heartland of the agriculture areas of the Great Kingdom and there's a large castle a day's right away, there's probably not a lot of reason for this town to have a wall. And building a wall around a town is really expensive. Like, it's a big undertaking to put a wall around a, a city, even in a fantasy world where there is magic. Of course, you could say that it was magically built, but it's worth giving some thought about. Oftentimes, a local militia or a local town guard though, might not be that powerful. If you have a town of a thousand people and you're pulling out the stat block of veterans to be the average town guard, that's a very powerful town guard for a very lo small little town. So, Oftentimes, you know, there, there might be only 1% of the population that is dedicated towards protecting the town or part, and maybe 2% that is signed up with the militia. So if you have a town of a, of a thousand people, it might be a stretch for them to even get 
25, 50 people together who are willing and able-bodied to swing a sword. And this might also inspire some of your NPCs and some of the problems in town. If your town is facing a problem and their local militia is comprised of an old man who's been the town captain for several years and their son is the next in line, but he's only 18 or 19 and has just taken on the role, you have this interesting dynamic of they might need the player character's help because they're used to dealing with a local drunk or a bandit if there's a bigger problem they might not be prepared to deal with it yeah even though the town might have a thousand people in it you know it's very likely that at least a third or a half of those are either children or elderly people and even the remainder it's not like the town probably has a sword or an armor or even a shield or a spear or a bow to give every single one of those people they might have a bow that's appropriate for hunting or something like that, but it's entirely possible that they can't just arm up everybody if the players are asking those sorts of questions. Next up, you wanna ask yourself, what is the culture, religion, or general disposition of the people in this town? A lot of these ideas on who the local leader is, what the culture is like, what is this town standing for, can really inspire the mood and feeling of that town. Now, sometimes this might actually need to be one of the first questions that you ask yourself. Your answers to the previous questions will inform this question and sometimes it works the opposite way. So depending on how you're approaching your design method, you might want to start asking, okay, what is the culture? What is, are the people in this town like? And work backwards from this question, but it works both ways and whichever way you decide to go is up to you. This might also connect you to the next question. What is the major resource in town? All towns exist for a reason. Is this a fishing village, a mining village? Is this a town that is fertile land or next to a forest where they export lumber? You don't need to go into the depths of trading mechanics and all of that. It could simply be they are a fishing village who sends fish to the nearby city and in return gets uh, some other gear and accessories and medical supplies from that city. Also, you don't need to think in mundane terms. You could have really interesting towns, because we are in a fantasy world, that have sprouted out because of a magical resource, or perhaps an old wizard tower that has magical properties, and a town is sprouted around the base of it because of the magical properties of that tower. Many towns might be built up around a resource, but sometimes the reason why the town exists is less of a tangible resource and more of an intangible matter of trade, economics, and politics. Perhaps the town was founded here because there was a fort and this is an, a strategic passage, or perhaps this is the mouth of a river or an important river crossing. And this town grew because of its importance for trade. In a lot of cases, um, there's gonna be towns that simply emerge for the simple fact that, generally speaking, people need to come together to get specialized supplies for farming, for growing, for just living the business of life. And so oftentimes you'll just see towns that kind of form about a days apart from one another in clusters. And they'll usually be clustered along things like, yeah, this is the this is the river's crossing. That's This is why the town is called River Cross or Old Bridge or, you know, Soldier's Tower because it was built to be, the town grew up around something related to economics, trade, or resources. Again, this is a key question in answering the history of your town. It might be related to the name of the town, and it could also be informed by the culture of the town as well. So when we ask these sort of questions, again, they're all things that we could work backwards from this point. So if you want to start with one of these questions when you are designing your town, rather than the player-focused questions first, this is a good way when you're building a larger world to approach your design of towns as well, because this is where it becomes more important to answer these questions and how the towns relate to each other than rather what are their individual things that the players need in them. Finally, what other landmarks, buildings, or special locations exist within your town? This kind of leans into the last one of if it's a river crossing called River Cross, the old bridge across the river might be a iconic bridge mm -hmm. that is well known. 
these little elements, and this one for me is very important, is it adds some mystery, intrigue, and history simply by having one thing that makes your town stand out. Earlier we talked about Dragon's End being the name of a town. If there is a great skeleton of an ancient dragon embedded in the side of a mountain with the town formed around that, that is a cool icon to make the town stand out and make it memorable for your players. Simply by thinking of one thing that makes the town unique and special can make the town memorable and a place that your players will want to go back to time and again because they'll always remember that dragon embedded in the side or the legendary bridge across the river. Yeah, I think one of my favorite examples of this is Draylin's Ferry from the Red Hand of Doom, which actually has a bit of history built into it because there was a bridge over the river that collapsed and so there's a ferry there instead and so the town grew up around the ferry across the river hence the name of the town itself. So this is one of those elements where the landmarks, the resources, the culture, and the town's name kind of all come together to form a complete package. And it's amazing how just as simple in a name such as Old Bridge or River Cross or Draylin's Ferry, you know what that town is now. So once you have that and kind of combine all of these questions for yourself and think of the key components that the players are going to ask you about, make a list of all of these, add NPCs to the important locations who are going to give the information to the players, engage with them, set them up to either rest, talk, or on their next quest. Now you have the fixings to make a really memorable town that your players can explore, come to love, fight for, or rest in and recuperate. When you are designing a fantasy town, you wanna to make a list of key locations that are found in the town, each associated with a non-player character and a one sentence description, plot hook, item or inventory or something interesting. You generate this list by asking yourself, by looking at first the questions that the players are probably going to ask when they arrive in town. So up on screen right now, these are the questions that we think are most likely to be asked by your players. If you work through this list and answer each of these questions by adding in a few quirky elements and NPCs, you're going to have enough to build your town. But if you want to make it more interesting, there's the list of questions that you want to ask yourself. These questions are up on screen will help you flesh out your your town and make it feel more like a vibrant and living place. Again, you don't have to have solid answers to all of these things. One or two sentences as an answer for each of these is more than enough to run the town at your game. So with all of these questions in mind, you're probably ready to start building some incredible and memorable towns for your player characters. Enjoy building the towns because that is probably the first step in your adventures of world building. And it can be really, really fun to explore and come up with unique and interesting ideas to bring your world to life. And starting with a small town for your players to visit is a great way to set them off on an epic adventure that they'll remember for a lifetime. So this has been a look at creating a fantasy town in Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition. Tell us about some of the amazing towns that you have created in the comments below. The videos that we create on our channel are made possible thanks to the incredible generosity of our Patreon supporters. If you enjoy the work that we do here on YouTube, please consider supporting the channel by following the links in the description below. And don't forget to check out our live play Shadows of Drakenheim, which airs Tuesday nights at 6 p.m. Eastern on Twitch. You can find all the previous episodes right up over here. And we have plenty more videos giving advice for Dungeon Masters right up over here. Please subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an episode. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you next time in, in the, the Dungeon. dungeon.